Hi, my name is Scott and welcome. This presentation is on carbohydrates. And as you can see from this picture, there are many different types of foods that contain carbohydrates. For example, fruits and vegetables, legumes, grains in the form of pasta, rice, and breads, uh, sweeteners, and many other different types of foods that contain carbohydrates. I'm going to go over a wide variety of topics related to carbohydrates, starting with the structure of carbohydrates. Simple carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates, artificial sweeteners, the digestion and absorption of carbohydrates, blood glucose levels, the functions of fiber, carbohydrate recommendations, and a little bit about diabetes and the metabolic syndrome. So the functions of carbohydrates are they supply us with energy. They help prevent using protein as a fuel, and they help prevent prolonged breakdown of lipids leading to ketosis. And that is when you keep breaking down uh, fats, it leads to ketones in the blood, uh, and it decreases the pH of our blood. And uh, carbohydrates are used as sweeteners. So with this slide here, I want to get across this point, that hydrogen has one bond. Oxygen has two bonds, nitrogen has three bonds, and carbon has four bonds. With that being said, if you've already had organic chemistry and you'll take this to heart, you could fast forward to the uh, top six alkanes or skip about seven minutes. I'm going to take about seven minutes and show you why these, uh, these compounds have these number of bonds. So this is a periodic table of elements, and it has uh, about 118 elements. And within that, there are less than 30 elements that are related to biochemistry that, that function in our body. And what I want to do with this presentation is only look at four of these atoms, which is hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So there's a few things that we can uh, take from this table uh, real quick. Actually, if you look at hydrogen, you can see it has a number one above it. That means the number of protons it has. In an atom, it has a nucleus which contains protons, neutrons. Protons are posit positively charged. The neutrons are neutral. And the electrons will orbit around the nucleus. And those electrons have a negative charge. So the number of protons, which is designated above the element, is also equal to the number of electrons in its shell, in, in its orbital. So as you can see, hydrogen has one electron, carbon has six, nitrogen has seven electrons, and oxygen has a total of eight electrons. Now, also with this, you can see that these numbers up top, this is number one, that means it has one electron in its outer shell. So it will have a number of orbits, but that last orbital sh shell will have that number of electrons, as carbon will have four electrons in its outer shell, and same with uh, nitrogen will have five, and oxygen will have six electrons in its outer shell. Also, there's something else interesting about this table, is that the first, these, these rows will let you know how many orbitals there are in an atom. So hydrogen has one orbital, and carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, since it's in the second row, it has two orbitals. What I'm going to do on the next slide is I'm going to condense these three into this uh, second row here, the first and second row, I'm going to condense these together so it would be a little easier. So again, I'm going to cover hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So this, starting with the orbitals in, in an atom, they are their name. First, the first orbital is the 1s orbital. As we see right here, it is 1s, and the next orbital going out is the 2s orbital. And these little numbers, the superscripts up top, is the number of electrons that it has in those orbitals. And the next orbital is the 2p orbital. And if you'll notice down here, the p orbital has an x, y, z in the p, and there will be two electrons, four and six. So that p orbital, again, has six electrons. There's actually three orbitals within that p uh, orbit. And also, going a little further, is we have the 3s orbital, and that has two electrons in that, and that fulfills that orbit. We're not going to go out that far from the nucleus. What we will do is, for the most part, go out to the third one, and then we'll condense that back into the second one, if you hang with me. So starting off with the most easy one is hydrogen. Again, hydrogen has one electron, and so what we'll do is, is scientists will fill these shells in with the number of electrons that these atoms have. 
since hydrogen has one electron and it has one orbital, we simply put one electron there and an electron in its outer orbital. And that is the 1s1. It has one electron in the s orbital. Since it has one valence, and this, since this is one electron in its outermost shell, and it's by itself, it's called a valence electron. So it has one valence electron, and therefore it can form one covalent bond. A covalent bond is electrons like to pair up. So this atom can bond with another uh, electron from another atom, and that will form a covalent bond. Now, carbon is it, a little more complicated. It's not that bad. Um, it has six electrons total. So what we'll do is we'll fill these shells in with the electrons, and I'll show you how that works. It has six electrons. We know it has two orbitals, but I have three here, and I'll show you why. The first will add, the, add in the electrons. One electron, two electrons, so that one S is full. Three electrons, four electrons, and so now the two S is full. And now we're, we have two electrons left, one, two. But the p orbital is, is, is not stable. So what we have to do is we're going to make this a hybrid orbital. We're going to combine the s with the p. And how we do that is we'll move one electron over into the p orbital to make that more stable. And now we have what is called an sp hybridized. And since p has three electrons in it, it is an sp3 hybridized orbital. So how will that look in the orbits? Like I said, um, we, only have, we only have two orbits. So what we're going to have to do, and, and since we made this stable, how that will look in, in the uh, atom, it will look more like this. We take those two orbitals and combine them together. And now we have four electrons, four electrons, four valence electrons will form four covalent bonds. And likewise with nitrogen and oxygen, let me briefly go over that. Nitrogen has seven electrons, and let's fill those in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, since um, we have five electrons in its outer shell, two, two of those electrons are paired together, and that is called a lone pair. And then the, the P will have three, so it's an sp3 hybridized. It has five valence electrons in its outer shell. But since there is one lone pair, we have three valence electrons that are available for covalent bonds. So like I said, nitrogen has three bonds. And oxygen is very similar. Again, uh, I, it has eight electrons, and we'll fill up the 1s, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now we have to fill up each one of these first, 5, 6, 7, and then we'll come back and fill up number 8. So if we look at this, and since it only has two orbits, we know that we have two lone pairs and two valence electrons. There's actually two, four, five, six valence electrons, but two of those are lone pairs. So we only have two electrons that are available to form two covalent bonds with oxygen. Okay, with that being said, we kind of have a little bit idea about how many bonds carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, and hydrogen can form. Excuse me. Okay, uh, in the beginning I went over on the overview, the science of nutrition. I went over the top 10 alkanes. Here I'm going to go over the top six alkanes, and, and I'll, I'll tell you why that this is, uh, I'm kind of pushing this, is because our body is organic in nature. So here's the top six. It's methane, and how I learned this again was methane, ethane, propane. propane. Methane, MEP, methane, ethane, propane. Then you've got butane, pentane, and hexane. So it's an alkane because we have a carbon-to-carbon -carbon bond. We have one bond for an alkane. An alkene is two bonds in between a carbon, and an alkyne is three carbons in between bonds. We're not going to be dealing with any alkynes. We will see alkenes and alkanes. And uh, going along a little further, so this is methane. It has a carbon. And as you can see, carbon has four bonds. One electron is shared with hydrogen, and that hydrogen electron is shared with carbon. And car uh, hydrogen has one bond. And that's the same with all of the straight uh, chain uh, carbon chains, alkanes. So ethane is a two-carbon chain, and propane is a three-carbon chain. Now, you'll also see these drawn as simple line structures. This has three carbons, propane, 
And this also has one carbon here, one carbon there, and one carbon there. You just have a carbon at each end and one at every angle. So what we can do is we can eliminate the hydrogen off of each end and turn this into a cyclic structure. And this will be cyclopropane. You can't really turn uh, methane and ethane into a cyclic structure. But starting with propane, you can turn that into a cyclic structure. And here is, again, butane, pentane, and hexane. Uh, butane with four carbons, pentane five, and hexane with six. And again, you can draw these inline structures. And there's one carbon, two carbon, three carbon, four carbon. Now, again, you can add the hydrogens on here, and there would be three hydrogens on this end, three hydrogens on the other end, two hydrogens on that angle, and two hydrogens there. As you can see, there's three, two, two, and three on the end. And again, you can form this chain if you uh, minus the hydrogens on each end. Those carbon to carbon will bond together, forming cyclobutane, and then cyclopentane. The reason I'm leading to these is because in, in um, biochemistry uh, related to nutrition, you will see many pentane structures, cyclo cyclic pentane structures and cyclohexane structures. Uh, more specifically, um, we're doing carbohydrates, and they are many, uh, that's basically what they are. So if we were to look at this, this cyclohexane and kind of flip it around on the side, that's what we'll be looking at as far as these sugars go. This is a molecule of glucose, and again, it is a it's a hex, not a hexane, but a hexose. It has oxygen, and it is a sugar molecule. So it's a hexose, and it, but it is a glucose. C6, C6, six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. And as you notice, we, we will number these on this carbon. We'll start here on these carbons throughout the galactose, glucose, and fructose coming up. But we'll start here, one, two, three, four, five, and the substituent coming off of it is the sixth carbon. Um, so, glucose is the main monosaccharide in the body. It is one of two sugars in each of the disaccharides, three disaccharides, and glucose is, is one of each one of those. It is the building blocks for polysaccharides, and polysaccharides are many sugar units, long chains of sugar units. It, they, they are referred to as blood sugar or dextrose, and glucose is the breakdown of starches and sucrose. Again, glucose is a source of fuel for our cells. Now, this hydroxyl is what is important on glucose. Um, in the next slide, I'll show you. But if we look at this one slide, in, in nutrition books, you'll see these um, monosaccharides as color-coded. But I really didn't want to do that. What I want you to do is recognize the spatula arrangement of these atoms on these cyclic structures. So here, we have... If we were looking at this in a plane, you'll have one hydrogen pointing up and a hydroxyl pointing down. And that's what's significant about glucose. So glucose provides us energy, and we get that from the form of plants through photosynthesis. And what happens is if you have six carbon dioxides and six water molecules with sunlight through energy, we will gain a molecule of glucose and six oxygens. And here is the equation for that. Six carbon dioxides plus six waters equals a molecule of glucose and six oxygens. So simple carbohydrates are monosaccharides and disaccharides. Excuse me. This is a, an organizational chart of the predominantly majority of what I'm going to discuss in this presentation. The monosaccharides are galactose, glucose, and fructose. Uh, I have these in order of their sweetness, with galactose being the least sweetest and fructose being the sweetest of these three monosaccharide sugars. Um, the disaccharides, again, it contains one glucose for each one of these, and then you have uh, a glucose, a galactose, or a fructose joined with that glucose. And then the complex carbohydrates are many uh, molecules of sugars, and they come in the forms of starches, fibers, and glycogen. Starches are, are, are plant storage of energy, and they are um, amylose and amylopectin. I'll go over those here briefly, uh, shortly. And fibers, they are either soluble or insoluble. We, we can, our, our bacteria in our colon can use it, or it can't use it, and if it doesn't, such as insoluble fibers, then we'll use it for colon health to exercise our muscles 
throughout the gastrointestinal tract. Um, glycogen is the uh, human or animal storage form of glucose, and it is stored in the muscle and the livers. Okay, monosaccharides. Again, like I was saying, there is galactose, glucose, and fructose. Now, if you'll notice, each one of these, if you count all of these, these um, atoms, the oxygen, the hydrogen, the carbon, they all come up with the same numbers. Each one of these have C6H12O6. That is the molecular formula for galactose, glucose, and fructose. But the significant difference between galactose and glucose is the hydroxyl. Again, on galactose, in a linear plane, the hydroxyl, and a hydroxyl is an oxygen and a hydrogen bonded together, and that's called a hydroxyl. So in galactose, the hydroxyl on the one, two, three, fourth carbon is pointing up. And on the glucose, the fourth carbon is pointing down. And that differentiates these two sugars from each other. And fructose, as you can see, it is a, a pentose. It has a five-membered ring. And again, it still has the same molecular formula. So glycose is converted to glucose in the liver. Everything is pretty much converted to glucose in the liver. Uh, fructose is in, in fruit, honey, and high fructose corn syrup, and it is converted to glucose in the liver. So, um, yeah, there's the hydroxyl. Okay, moving forward. So the way we attach these monosaccharides together is through hydrolysis. What we'll do is simply take a water molecule out of these, these two monosaccharides, and they will join together. And how we do that is we'll take a hydroxyl off of one and a hydrogen off of the other, and they will both born, uh, bond excuse me, to this oxygen through a glycosidic bond. And that linkage, when they, they bond in a straight chain linkage, is considered an alpha 1,4 linkage glycosidic bond. So in the in reverse of that is in we want to we want to um, break apart some of these chains, we add a water molecule. And adding the water molecule is called hydrolysis. We'll just add the water molecule and it will separate that, the hydroxyl bonds, the hydrogen bonds, and it separates that. So let me go over this quickly. Condensation links the monosaccharides together to form a disaccharide. A hydroxyl group from one sugar molecule and a hydrogen from another leaves as a molecule of water. And again, hydrolysis is the breaking of, of a bond and that occurs as water molecule is added to linked sugar molecules, creating multiple molecules. Okay, the disaccharides, they consist of maltose, lactose, and sucrose. And again, the disaccharides are also simple sugars. So this is maltose, and it, it, it contains a glucose, two glucose uh, units. And again, it has an alpha-1,4 linkage connecting the glucose and the glucose together to form maltose, and maltose is the least sweetest of these three disaccharides. Uh, fermentation of maltose is for alcohol production, and it, the, it is produced by the breakdown of starch, and barley is most notable for maltose. Lactose, again, here is, is galactose and glucose. So we have another alpha-1,4 linkage glycosidic linkage. And lactose, it's the principal carbohydrate of milk um, and milk products. It's referred to as milk sugar. And once absorbed, the liver will convert the lactose to glucose. It will convert the galactose to glucose, and you will remain with another glucose molecule. So sucrose, it is a glucose uh, monosaccharide and a fructose monosaccharide bonded together. And this is the sweet, sweetest of the three sugars because the fructose is most available to the taste buds uh, for taste. And the sucrose, uh, the fructose makes the sucrose taste sweet. The juice of sugarcane is pressed, uh, the juice is taken out, and then also in, in sugar beets and sugarcane, and it is refined to make sucrose, which is table sugar. Sucrose is processed to make brown, white, and table sugar, and I'll go over that in a few minutes. Okay, complex carbohydrates, that is glycogen, starch, and fiber. Oligosaccharides are 3 to 10 monosaccharides. They are polysaccharides, but they're the short polysaccharides. And they are found in legumes, which legumes are, are plants that have clusters of pods, which are those plant seeds. And for us, they are foods. And they are in beans, peas, lentils, peanuts. And cruciferous vegetables 
um, such as cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, and etc. These are not digested, and these oligosaccharides are not digested, and they are metabolized by bacteria in the large intestine, and they will cause gas. And there, is, there are products out there, such as Beano, that contains an enzyme called alpha-galactosidase, and that will help uh, digest and break down these, these um, polysaccharides, oligosaccharides, into uh, simple sugars. So complex carbohydrates, again, that, that is, is glycogen, starch, and fiber. Glycogen is the storage form of energy in the liver and muscles for, for um, humans and animals. Starch is a storage form of energy in plants, and we'll look at amylose and amylopectin. And fiber is, is, it provides structure for plants in their skins, trunks, leaves, roots, and their stems. And fibers are either soluble or insoluble. So here's a, a glycogen uh, molecule. This, it, has, it is highly branched. Glycogen, ha glycogen has many sugars attached to it, and it is highly branched. Um, it, it's highly branched, and, and that provides uh, more sites. At each one of these ends, you have the ability for an enzyme to cleave off that monosaccharide, and that gives the, us the ability to increase our blood sugar levels pretty rapidly. It uses a primer molecule to start off with. This is called glycogen, and there's no reason to uh, learn that right now. Um, it consists of two uh, tyrosine uh, amino acids that is called a dimer. But that glycogen starts the, the chain of the, the glucose units and, and in the form of uh, storage form of glycogen. And um, the liver glycogen, it, it stores about 80 grams of, of uh, these carbohydrates of, of glycogen, and it's approximately 320 kilocalories of energy. Muscle glycogen stores about 350 grams, and that yields approximately 1,400 kilocalories per gram. Now, this is, uh, I'm sorry, it stores about 1,400 kilocalories per gram. Okay, so this, this is a straight chain. This is the straight chain part of uh, glycogen. And it is, again, bonded by a 1,4 glycosidic linkage. And whenever it branches off, it has a 1,6, alpha 1,6 linkage. So the straight chains are alpha 1,4 linkages, and the branches here, when it branches off here, it will be an alpha 1,6 linkage. So starches. There are thousands of glucose molecules linked together. They are grains, fruits, vegetables, tubers, um, there's a couple types of tubers. There are stem tubers and root tubers. Root, uh, the stem tubers are like potatoes. What happens is the plant uh, will form stems right under the surface of the soil, and it will have a, a bulb there, which will take the plant through um, uh, periods of, of, of low nutrition, uh, poor sunlight, uh, poor uh, water, and, and such like that. So it will house nu nutrients for that plant to survive, through the stems, and that's potatoes are stem tubers. There are root tubers which are connected to the bottom of the plant, and it, it forms a bulb there. And those are in the form of sweet potatoes, yams, and yucca, such, and also legumes and root crops. So amylose, again, it has the alpha 1 4 glycosidic linkage, and that is a straight chain. This is a plant storage form of, of glucose, and it it starts to coil up, and this is what a uh, amylose will look like. Amylopectin, again, is, is highly branched. It's not as branched as glycogen. Glycogen is the most efficient storage form of glucose. And here we have amylopectin. It has the long straight chains as the alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkages, and where it branches off, it has the alpha-1,6 glycosidic bonds. So, 20% of the digestible starch in plants is amylose, and 80% of that digestible starch of amylopectin is amylopectin. And here again, amylopectin will have multiple sites for enzyme action, and that will increase blood sugar levels pretty fast too. So fibers. Humans lack the enzyme that's needed to break the beta-1,4 glycosidic bonds, and this is a glycosidic beta-1,4 glycosidic bond. We don't have that enzyme in our body, so we can't digest it. 
what will happen is either it will be considered insoluble or, or um, soluble. The insoluble, it is, it is not fermented by the bacteria in our colon. And that is the insoluble fibers. It is cellulose, lignin, and hemicellulose. In plant walls, cell walls, it has a primary wall. And that primary wall, it's the outermost wall, is the cellulose. And a little further in is the hemicellulose. And the lignin will bind these two structures together to provide protection to the, the fleshy part of the plant, um, which has the nutrients in it. The soluble fibers, <clears throat> they are viscous, and they are in fruits, vegetables, rice, bran, uh, psyllium seed, and they are considered pectins, gums, and mucilages. They form solutions in gels in water, which helps delay emptying of the stomach. They stabilize blood glucose levels, and they reduce cholesterol and increase satiety, uh, the feeling of fullness. Again, the... the um, Insoluble fibers, they will increase the fecal bulk and provide colon health, uh, gastrointestinal health throughout the whole tract. And it increases intestinal transit time. Okay, this is a picture representation of a few of the fibers. Again, pectin, it is the, the more the meaty, fleshy part of the, um, of the fruit, and that is a viscous fiber. It, it's viscous. There are the, the pectin, the the pectin gums and mucilages, they um, provide us with nutrients. And here is a, the picture of cellulose, lignin, and hemicellulose. It's the outer part of the wheat germ. And we don't digest this, and the bacteria in our colon won't digest it. But the bacteria in our colon will digest the pectins, uh, gums, and mucilages. OK, functional fibers. That is extracted from plants and added to foods or used as supplements that provide health benefits. So they'll, take, they'll extract the fiber from plants and, and add it to foods, and it's also used in supplements. It is considered a prebiotic, and a prebiotic is a type of functional fiber that promotes uh, beneficial bacteria in the colon. Okay, nutritive sweeteners and non-nutritive sweeteners. They are also referred to as artificial sweeteners. Starting with nutritive sweeteners, and the reason they're called nutritive means that they yield some energy. With high fructose corn syrup, that is a corn starch that undergoes an enzymatic process. Some glucose is converted to fructose. So normally in sucrose, you have the fructose and glucose molecules at a ratio of about 50-50. But under this, this enzymatic process, they turn some of that glucose into fructose to make it sweeter. And that's where it becomes high fructose corn syrup. The sucrose, like I said, is about 50-50 uh, uh, of glucose and fructose. The benefits of this is that it is cheaper than importing sugar cane or sugar beets. There is, the corn is abundant in the United States, and it does not form the sugar crystals. It's more easily transported, it has an increased shelf life, and it is preferred by the food industry as it improves the food properties, such as for baking. Now, here's an article from the uh, American, uh, they changed their name, American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Um, now it is the Journal of Nutrition and Dietetics, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Okay, these nutritive sweeteners, um, again, there's turbinado sugar, and that is considered raw sugar. It, it is sugar cane juice that has been drained and then put into these turbines to dry. And it will retain the molasses color. And molasses is a byproduct of the processing of, of sugar cane. So they'll leave some of that molasses color in there, and it's not further processed as table sugar. Table sugar, it has a further processing, and it's used, it, they use bone char. And what that is, it's kind of, it's ground up bone, animal bone, and they take out the hydrogen and oxygen, and you're left with carbon. And it's a powder, and that will remove the molasses color, leaving it as a white table sugar. And in brown sugar, they, they, it is pretty much identical to table sugar, but they add some of the molasses coloring back in, and the flavor, you can taste that. Maple syrup, it's the sap of, of sugar maple trees. It's expensive, and for the most part, whenever you have like a, a maple syrup for your pancakes or something, um, that is not 100% maple 
maple syrup. It, it's cornstarch and high fructose corn syrup and a little bit of maple syrup for the flavoring. Honey, it, it's enzyme altered plant nectar uh, from sucrose to fructose and glucose. So the, the bee will come along with its, its enzyme and, and it will break that down um, from sucrose to fructose and glucose. And it, it <clears throat> contains Clostri Clostridium botulinum, which is, uh, it, it, it has spores. And for adults, it's not that detrimental because we have a high pH in our stomach. But for infants and toddlers, it, it could be very detrimental because this is a foodborne illness. Okay, sugar alcohols. Uh, sorbitol and xylitol. They both yield approximately 2.6 kilocalories per gram, and it, it may have a laxative effect if it's consumed in large quantities. Um, the decreased catabolism of sugar alcohols by bacteria in the mouth, it prevents the dental caries. So that's why it is preferred. Um, it is valuable in chewing gum, mints, and other substances held in the mouth for periods of time. The advice from the ADA is that use these, and, and this goes for pretty much all nutritious and non-nutritive sweeteners, use moderately with nutritious diet. It is beneficial for diabetics and it can decrease energy intake. Okay, non-nutritive sweeteners. These are also called artificial sweeteners and alternative sweeteners. And they use sucrose as a frame of reference for its level of sweetness, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. This is neotame. Neotame, excuse me. It is 7,000 to 13,000 times sweeter than sucrose. Um, this is an aspartame. And what they do, it, it's similar to aspartame, but they added neo means new, and hex is, again, six carbons. So they added a six carbon chain to aspartame, and they call it neotame. The, <clears throat> excuse me. Cost benefits to the food manufacturers are great due to the high sweetness. So since it's so high, you don't need as much to sweeten the product that you're selling. It is heat stable, so you can use it for cooking. It, it was approved by the FDA in 2002 for use in the United States. It is not catabolized to amino acids in the body, and it is not digested or absorbed. The adequate daily intake is approximately 18 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So again, if you weigh 150 pounds, you divide that by 2.2, and you'll have the number of kilograms. And then you do that by 18, and you'll know how much you can have. I'm going to use uh, cans of diet soda as a reference, because coming up uh, shortly, I, you'll see that, that added sugars in the American diet are, are about 50% of our, our added sugars in our diet come from drinks. So I'm going to use this cans of diet soda. And, and so neotame is uh, approximately eight cans of diet soda is 18 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Sucralose, also known as Splenda, is 600 times sweeter than sucrose. Um, it is similar to sucrose in that what, all they did was they took off a hydroxyl on three bonds and added a chlorine. So it is heat stable. You can use it for cooking. It's approved by the FDA in 1998 for use in the United States, and it is not digested or absorbed. The adequate daily intake is 5 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, which is approximately six cans of diet soda. Okay, saccharin, this is a, was a highly controversial uh, food additive, and uh, let me go over that briefly. Um, as you see, it, it is a two, it's a six ring and a five ring structure with a sulfur added to it. Um, it's three ti 300 times sweeter than sucrose. It was the first alternative sweetener produced in 1879, and it was approved by the FDA in 1879 for use in the United States. It represents approximately 50% of the alternative sweeteners used in North America. It was once considered to cause bladder cancer in animals in the 1970s. There was uh, some studies in Canada, I believe it was, that it was shown that, that saccharin um, causes uh, tumors in the bladder. And you know, it was banned in 1977 until they had some rigorous studies and, and went over it many times. And then it was reapproved by the FDA in 2001. It is absorbed and excreted, and it is in little pink packets such as sweet and low. The adequate daily intake is 5 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, and that is approximately equal to 10 packets of sweetener. Okay, acosulfame K. Now, the reason they call it K is it has a potassium added to the cyclic structure. 
Um, it is 200 times sweeter than sucrose. It was approved by the FDA in 1988, 1988 excuse me, for use in the United States. It is used in over 40 countries worldwide. It is not digested by the body. It is heat stable, so you can use it for cooking. And the adequate daily intake is 15 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, and that is approximately equal to 30 cans of diet soda. Okay, aspartame. This is the most controversial and most tested uh, added nutri uh, nutrient added to foods in, in history. Um, it is 180, 180 to 200 times sweeter than sucrose. It has two amino acids. It has aspartic acid, or also aspartate, and phenylalanine, and it has a methanol. It is digested and absorbed because they are amino acids. It will digest it and absorb it. The energy yield is approximately 4 kilocalories per gram, but again, it's beneficial even though that is equal to the same energy yield as carbohydrates, it has an increased level of sweetness, so you will decrease the amount of product that you need. It is not heat stable, so it's not too good for cooking in, uh, cooking in products that require cooking. Um, it is proved by the FDA in 1974 for use in the United States, but there was a small uh, population that, that sent in complaints to the FDA of headaches, dizziness, seizures, and nausea, etc. And this began a somewhat of a smear campaign against aspartame, and it was all over the internet. There was an individual that was spearheading this, and the reason they <clears throat> were looking so hard at this is because the methanol, and the methanol is converted into formaldehyde, which is quickly converted to other products in the body, so it's really not a major issue. But since there was so many debates about it, they had, to, had scientists test it, the FDA tested it, and, you know, so it came about to give it warning labels. Again, it was approved by the FDA in 1974. So what they did is they put warning labels on it simply because of the phenylalanine. And there are people that are, have a genetic inheritance of uh, phenylketonuria, it, it's PKU, um, which you don't metabolize this phenylalanine, this amino acid. And they normally do uh, uh, urine tests that will, will uh, identify this, this condition um, when you're born. So um, they put these warning labels on the packages just to let you know that it contains aspartame. And if you have uh, uh, PKU sensitivity, um, you will not use the product. So its adequate daily intake is 50 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, and that's approximately equal to 18 cans of diet soda. Uh, stevia, it's also known as sweet leaf. It is 100 to 300 times sweeter than sucrose. It is a bush in South America. It is digested and absorbed. It doesn't provide any energy. And in 2008, it was generally recognized as safe, grass. And that the difference between generally recognized as safe or approved by the FDA is who holds the data and the information. If the data and information is widespread and you have a large body of scientists studying this and they, they come upon a general consensus that this, this additive or food is safe, then they will give it the, the generally recognized as safe. Uh, versus a, if you have a, a company or a, an entity that is trying to market a product, then they hold the, the data and the information. So they will try to, um, they have to submit it to the FDA to get it either, to get it approved, uh, whether it's approved or disapproved. Um, the adequate daily intake is four milligrams per kilogram of body weight, and that is approximately five cans of diet soda. Excuse me. Okay. Tagatose is also known as neutralose. It is not as sweet as sucrose. It is 92% the sweetness of sucrose. It is altered from fructose in that, if you look at fructose here, the, the spatial arrangement of the atoms here, again, the hydroxyl on tagatose is pointing up, but on fructose, it is pointing down. So they just switch those around, and they've made them a product. Um, it, again, it's an altered form of fructose. It has poor absorption. The energy yield is approximately 1.5 kilograms 
per gram, and it does not increase blood glu glucose levels or cause tooth decay, so it's beneficial there. It acts as a prebiotic uh, effect, and it is fermented by the large intestine. In 2001, it was generally recognized as safe, and the adequate daily intake for tagatose is 7.5 grams per day. Okay, digestion and absorption of carbohydrates. Starting with cooking, the cooking softens the fibers and it makes it easier to chew and swallow. The mouth, the salivary amylase, breaks down the polysaccharides into shorter polysaccharides and disaccharides. There is limited digestion due to short duration in the mouth. However, pro prolonged chewing will increase the uh, amount of digestion. The stomach, the hydrochloric acid will inactivate the salivary amylase and there is no digestive enzymes for carbohydrate digestion in the stomach. So as the fiber moves slowly through the gastrointestinal tract, namely the stomach, it will provide a feeling of satiety, a feeling of fullness. The small intestine, we went over this in digestion and absorption, but again, the pancreas will release most digestive enzymes into the duodenum. That's the first part of the small intestine. The pancreatic amylase will catabolize these polysaccharides into shorter uh, saccharides, uh, polysaccharides and to disaccharides. The absorptive cells in the intestinal, in the intestine, the small intestine, will release these three enzymes called maltase, sucrase, and lactase. Um, they will break down maltose, sucrose, and lactose. Um, they break those down, the, the disaccharides, to monosaccharides, uh, glucose, galactose, and fructose for absorption in the small intestine. The monosaccharides will drain into the portal vein and go to the liver where it is converted to glucose which will be released into the bloodstream for use or it will be stored as glycogen or lipids. And here is a pictorial representation of what I just went over. The polysaccharides will come um, they, they will meet the salivary amylase and break those into shorter chains of polysaccharides. And then the pancreatic amylase that is released um, will go into the duodenum, the duodenum, and it will break those down into disaccharides. And these disaccharides will brush against the microvilli in the small intestine, namely the uh, jejunum, and it will brush against those and, and release the sucrase, lactase, and maltase, breaking those disaccharides into monosaccharides. And this is a, a, a representation of how they, the monosaccharides absorb. So this is monosaccharide absorption. And the only thing I want to show you here basically, again, I went over this once, is galactose and glucose is transported into the uh, small intestine through act of transport, and that means it takes energy in the form of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And the facilitated diffusion will take fructose across the membrane. And each one of them have a specific carrier. Uh, this is really not important at this level, but I just want to point it out. Um, fructose will use a glucose transporter 5, GLUT5 transporter, and galactose and glucose will each use uh, the same transporter uh, at different times, uh, the solute glucose transporter one. And the reason it's a solute glucose transporter is for every molecule of galactose and glucose, you'll take two sodium uh, atoms with it. So, and, and then it will come out the basal lateral side of the, uh, the, the cell, and that will come through facilitated diffusion. Each one of these, the glucose, galactose, and fructose, will come out through the glucose transporter two. Okay, so again, the only thing I wanted to point out here is that there is active transport and facilitated diffusion. Okay, the large intestine. The viscous fiber is fermented by the bacteria in the large intestine. That releases the acids and gases for absorption. The rectum and the anus, the indigestible, non-fermentable fibers are excreted in the feces. Okay, lactose mouth digestion. Um, as age increases, lactase activity decreases in approximately 70% of the population worldwide. The older you get, the less lactase you produce. And this is an article, um, a, a big study that everybody references as far as the decrease in lactase production. You can look that up. Um, 
the primary lactase maldigestion, lactose maldigestion, excuse me, is a decrease in lactase production due to age that leads to undigested and malabsorption of lactose. The undigested and malabsorbed lactose is then metabolized by the bacteria in the large intestine, which will cause bloating, abdominal discomfort, diarrhea, and cramping. Now, that is the primary lactose maldigestion. But if you have severe symptoms after lactose intake, that is called lactose intolerance. And the secondary, secondary lactose maldigestion, it is a temporary decrease in lactase production, and it is related to a precipitating factor such as an intestinal bacteria. Okay, adaption to lactose malabsorption. If you are, uh, have challenges with lactose, then what you should do is determine your tolerance level. You'll, you'll learn how much lactose, the milk sugars, you can take in. And then what you'll do is spread those evenly throughout the day so you can get some of the needed nutrients, such as calcium, riboflavin, and other nutrients that you get through dairy products. Um, you will consume lactose-containing products with other foods, such as fat, for increased digestion time. And cheese, which contains low lactose, uh, which is it's lost in uh, its production, you can eat more of that. Um, bacteria in yogurts contribute lactase in the small intestine. So you can eat the yogurts because they help break down the lactose if you have uh, challenges with lactose. And then again, you can use lactate, which has an enzyme that would help you break down the lactose. Okay, blood glucose levels. The liver will regulate glucose that enters the bloodstream, and it works with the pancreas, which releases insulin and glucagon. Hyperglycemia is high blood glucose, and hypoglycemia is low blood glucose. And with low blood glucose, you will have weakness, trembling, rapid heartbeat, sweating, anxiety, and hunger. Two forms of hypoglycemia are reactive hypoglycemia, and that occurs two to four hours approximately, after, excuse me, eating a meal, which is possibly due to over-secretion of insulin. Uh, fasting hypoglycemia it, it is usually caused by pancreatic cancer, and that leads to overproduction of insulin. Okay, now here's a, a graphical representation of how this works. If you have high blood glucose, it will promote insulin, re insulin release from the pancreas. The pancreas will release the insulin, it will pull the, the blood sugar, it will pull the sugars out of the blood, and if you have uh, enough storage, if you have enough uh, energy in your blood, it will uh, store it as insulin will promote glucose storage as glycogen, and it will decrease, it will start decreasing the blood sugar level. It will also store uh, glucose in the form of glycogen into cells, and it will it will, the glucose will also be used by cells as energy. Now, if you have low blood glucose levels, it will promote the, the pancreas to uh, release glucagon. And the glucagon will stimulate catabolism of the glycogen, breaking that down and releasing glucose into the blood, increasing blood glucose levels. And that will cause, in, in this symbiotic relationship, will normalize uh, the blood glucose levels, which is in between 70 milligrams per deciliter to 100 milligrams per deciliter. Okay, epinephrine and norepinephrine, I, I spoke about this once. Uh, these are released from the adrenal glands that sit on top of the kidneys. And this is used in a, a flight, fight or flight response. So if you're in some type of danger or something like that, it's part of the sympathetic nervous system and it will promote glycogen catabolism to glucose to increase blood uh, glucose levels in the, the bloodstream. So insulin. What insulin does, it promotes glycogen synthesis in the liver and muscles. What we just talked about. It will promote glucose uptake by the cells. The cells will take it um, and use it for energy, or the muscles will store it again as glycogen. It will inhibit gluconeogenesis, that is, breaking down glycogen and creating new glucose molecules, and it will decrease blood glucose levels. So it will take the glucose out of the bloodstream and store it as glycogen 
or it will use it as fuel. Uh, glucagon, what it does, it, it catabolizes the glycogen in the liver and the muscles uh, to be used as glucose. The muscles, we don't have a, an enzyme, what's called glucose 6-phosphatase. You don't have to worry about that, but the muscles will use that for energy for its muscles. They're pretty uh, selfish as far as that goes. But the liver uh, will break down that uh, glycogen and it will send its sugars throughout the body. So again, glucagon will promote gluconeogenesis. It will start breaking down these sugars and it increases blood glucose levels. The glycemic index, it is an index that ranks the carbohydrates of a given food on a scale from 0 to 100, according to the increase of blood glucose levels after eating. Um, it is a ratio of blood glucose uh, response to a given food compared to glucose, which has a glycemic index of 100. So the blood glucose is the frame of reference, and they use that as a uh, the reference of 100 glycemic index. So the glycemic load, it is the number of grams of carbohydrates in a food minus its fiber multiplied by the glycemic index of that food, and then you divide that by the uh, reference of 100. So here's a, a brief example. For example, um, if you have 225 grams a cup of bananas uh, with a glycemic index of 52, so you'll take the total carbohydrates, which is 51.4 grams, and subtract the amount of fiber. And that will equal 45.5 grams of carbohydrates. And then you will multiply that by its glycemic index, 45 uh, times the 52, uh, and then divide that by 100, and you'll have a glycemic load of 24. A high glycemic load uh, causes high insulin response, which leads to increased blood triglycerides. So you start bringing in uh, triglycerides in the bloodstream. It will increase fat synthesis and deposition. It will deposit a lot of fat, um, and it increases uh, low-density lipoproteins. And these LDLs, uh, they bring cholesterol to the tissues from the liver. So it's... Um, that's not a good thing. It will also increase clotting, and it has a rapid return of hunger. And this will eventually lead to insulin resistance, uh, which leads to type 2 diabetes. So with a high glycemic load, you can lead to insulin resistance. And what that is, is your pancreas produces the insulin, but the cells uh, don't recognize the ability to take the, the glucose into the cell, and that is insulin resistance. So functions of fiber, soluble fiber and cholesterol. Um, fruits, vegetables, beans, and whole grains with a the fiber there. It, high soluble fiber intakes inhibits cholesterol absorption. So it will decrease cholesterol absorption as the dietary fiber is taken into the body. The cholesterol will bind into the fiber. And it decreases blood cholesterol, which decreases the risk for cardiovascular disease, disease excuse me, and gallstones. The soluble fiber, again, as the, the cholesterol binds to the fibers, and so will the glucose, um, it will slow glucose absorption, so it, it's spread throughout these fibers, and it will provide better glucose regulation and decrease insulin secretions. Um, the decreased insulin secretion decreases cholesterol synthesis in the liver. Okay, uh, hemorrhoids and diverticula. A diet deficient in fiber decreases water absorption in the intestine, leading to hard stools and possible constipation, uh, causing excessive straining during defecation. Uh, excessive straining can lead to both hemorrhoids and diverticula. In, in cases of diverticulus, now diverticula is this outpocketing. These, these structures on the large colon are called haustra. And if you strain too hard, it will cause a diverticula, a, a swelling in these haustra. And if a food gets in there, specifically seeds or nuts or something like that will get in there, it will become inflamed. And initially, the dietary fiber um, intake is reduced to prevent the bacterial uh, inflammation. And then the fiber is added back to the diet after the inflammation um, is, is decreased to uh, ease the elimination. Uh, fiber and weight control. The bulky nature of fiber increases mastication, that's chewing, and slows gastric emptying while providing a feeling of satiety, a feeling of fullness. The soluble fiber slows glucose absorption, 
uh, helping regulate energy intake. Fiber and colon cancer. You know, there's been a lot of studies. The studies of fiber uh, related to cancer are controversial. So what you want to focus on are fruits, vegetables, beans, and whole grains. High fiber foods are more nutrient dense, as we went through those through the U.S. Dietary Guidelines. Carbohydrate recommendations. The RDA is 130 grams per day for adults, which is approximately 520 kilocalories. Uh, and that is based on brain and the central nervous system needs. The brain and red blood cells receive the first bit of glucose. So that is necessary uh, immediately. Um, that's the carbohydrate recommendation for the RDA. Um, the recommendations vary. The acceptable macronutrient distribution range is, uh, is between 45 and 65 percent of total calories in the diet. So if you look at these, you'll notice that the AMDR is 0.45 and 0.65. So you'll simply multiply the 0.45 times 2,000 and you'll get 900 and the upper range is 1,300 kilocalories. So it's in between 900 and 13 kilocalories is the acceptable macronutrient distribution range. And on nutrition facts labels on packages, it, the recommendation is 60%. So there you would, uh, again, multiply the 0.6 times 8. They are referenced as a 2,000 kilocalorie diet. And you will multiply the 0.6 times the 2,000 kilocalories in a day, and you come up with 1,200 kilocalories. So these are very close, the, the upper end of the AMDR and the nutrition facts labels with 1,300 and 1,200. And the average U.S. intake is in between 180 and 330 grams, uh, which is somewhere between 720 and 1,300 kilocalories. And that's approximately 15, uh, 50, excuse me, 50 percent of the kilocalories of, of the intake. Again, focus on fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. <clears throat> dietary recommendations of uh, dietary fiber intake. That is based on decreasing risk for cardiovascular disease. The adequate intake is 25 grams per day for women and 38 grams per day for men. After the age of 50, then it's 21 grams and 30 grams respectively for women and then men. The daily value, which is again on the food label packaging, is 25 grams for the reference 2,000 kilocalorie uh, per day. A goal is 14 grams per 1,000 kilocalories. So um, that's frame of reference, uh, which is again 28 grams per 2,000 kilocalories. The average U.S. intakes is 13 grams per day for women and 17 grams per day for men. Excess fiber is, is not a good thing. It, it, greater than 60 grams per day, it, what that will do, the, the increased amount of fiber will draw in more water into the body and into the, the uh, gastrointestinal tract, and that may decrease availability of some minerals. There's, there's uh, phytates um, that will, will bind um, in the fibers that will bind calcium and some other nutrients that will prevent their absorption. So too much of that fiber may decrease some needed nutrients. Um, and if you have an increased amount of fiber, you will have a decreased amount of a moderate, balanced uh, uh, meal. So the unmet energy needs in children, if children uh, consume too much uh, fiber, then that will decrease the amount of energy that they need. Added sugars. Um, this is a, a picture I was referring to early, and, and if you notice that this comes from the 2010 Dietary Guidelines, this is a reference for that, um, again, the soda energy, soda and energy drinks is a little greater than 35%, and if you also notice, fruit drinks is greater than 10.5%, so that is almost 50% of the intake consumption of drinks for added sugars, which is substantial. So if you wanted to try to decrease some of your, your calories, uh, this would be a good place to start is through um, beverages. So simple sugar limitations. The, the problems associated with simple sugars are that they are empty calories. They have low nutrient density. And 
they, and increased risk for dental caries. They are added sugars to foods and beverages. The World Health, excuse me, the World Health Organization uh, requires, suggests that it is 10% or less of total kilocalories per day. And that is somewhat equal to 50 grams or 12 tablespoons per day of these added sugars. And that is approximately 200 kilocalories per every 2,000 kilocalorie diet. North Americans consume 16% of total kilocalories per day with added sugars, and that is approximately 82 grams per day. And this is the position of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics on nutritive and non-nutritive sweeteners. It's a great article referring to simple sugars and how you should, should moderate those with a well-balanced and nutrition, nutritious diet. Diabetes myelitis, that is that consists of type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and gestational diabetes. So with type 1 diabetes, it is, it is approximately 5 to 10 percent of the cases in the United States. It begins in late childhood, predominantly between the age of 8 and 12 years of age. But it is becoming uh, earlier and earlier as, as we go into uh, an obese nation greater than 50 percent. Uh, studies suggest that ge genetic prevalence is, is prevalent in some um, cultures, sp uh, specifically Hispanic Americans, African Americans, Asian Americans, Native Americans, and Pacific Islanders. The pancreas here stops producing insulin due to an autoimmune disorder. And what happens there is they're really not positive what happens, but it could be uh, a, a, an invading uh, pathogen or some type of protein that will trigger um, an autoimmune, a, a, an immune response to attack our pancreas. And then we stop producing the insulin. The treatment is insulin therapy, and that is injections in between two to six times per day, depending upon your needs. The diet therapy is three regular meals and one or more snacks with a bedtime snack. And this is, is also structured with the carbohydrate, protein, and fat ratios to promote normal glucose, blood glucose levels. And again, that is 70 milligrams per deciliter to 100 milligrams per deciliter. So what you're doing here is trying to spread your meals out through the day to maintain that blood glucose level and then eat a bedtime snack, they give this in hospitals, um, and to maintain the blood sugar levels throughout the night. And this is, um, this is a glucose tolerance test. It is a comparison of a diabetic and a non-diabetic and, and this is where the glucose is given and they watch the, how the glucose um, is increased in the blood levels and it starts to decrease. For a non-diabetic, the insulin, uh, the, the glucose level is normally given as, as, say for example, a 50 gram load of glucose and then they'll test the uh, blood glucose levels uh, periodically uh, for three hours and they'll notice that the increase um, from a normal range and it'll increase uh, a little bit above and then what happens is the insulin will start kicking in and it will pull the glucose out of the blood and into the cells. Whereas if you're a diabetic, it starts above the normal range and it will increase and increase and the only reason it starts to decrease here, and this is on multiple uh, multiple studies where it starts to decrease and this decrease is not the insulin, they don't have the insulin um, pulling it into the cells. This is, meets a, a threshold in the kidney that the threshold will, will come to with the glucose levels and it starts spilling over into the urine. But as you can see, it is still above the recommended intake. And here is a reference for that, uh, this graph here. So type 2 diabetes. It is normally in adults 40 years of age, and it is previously considered adult onset diabetes, but now it is a, a, an epidemic uh, incidences for adolescents and children which are acquiring diabetes in an early age related specifically to obesity. Uh, multiple types of studies link overweight and obesity and inactivity as the precipitating factor to type 2 diabetes. And this leads again to insulin resistance where the cells uh, don't have enough insulin. You know, you, your pancreas could be de releasing some insulin, but not enough insulin. It's kind of like the insulin is knocking on the door to the cell, and it just doesn't have enough 
enough insulin to get in, or the cells themselves become insulin resistant no matter how much insulin you have. And the treatment for this is weight loss and increased activity, insulin therapy, uh, diet therapy, and oral medications. Um, gestational diabetes is high blood sugar that starts or is first diagnosed during pregnancy around the 24th uh, week of pregnancy. And it is an abnormal function of the insulin receptors. Again, the receptors on the cell, they're not um, recognizing the insulin. So it is likely due to pregnancy related to factors such as the presence of human placental lactogen, in other words, a hormone that may interfere with the susceptible uh, insulin receptors. And again, you'll have glucose tolerance tests uh, taken um, if you're pregnant in between the 24th and 28th week. So you can uh, determine your needs. Okay, metabolic syndrome, this is also known as, it was uh, termed syndrome X by Dr. Raven uh, many years ago, and that is greater than 25% of adults in the United States have it. Um, it is characterized by having a clustering of metabolic abnormalities, which are risk factors for cardiovascular disease, stroke, and diabetes. Um, insulin resistance that has not yet met the diabetes threshold, um, which is considered a blood glucose level greater than or equal to 126 milligrams per deciliter. So you have, it's kind of like a pre-diabetes of insulin resistance. And then abdominal obesity is a precipitating factor of insulin resistance and a main characteristic to be considered for metabolic syndrome. And an estimated 50 million Americans have metabolic syndrome. Um, and this is, you know, there, there are, Many different organizations will have their own definition of metabolic syndrome. The next slide, I'm going to show you the parameters for metabolic syndrome. And some people will say if you have one and two of these or three of, of any one of these five. But this is a, a, a study done by the American Heart Association, World Heart Federation, the International Association of Atherosclerosis Society, um, the study of obesity. And this is... Uh, an article called Harmonizing the Metabolic Syndrome. And what they do is they try to clarify the parameters and make sure they try to make it universal. And here's the, a link to that, that article. Um, so these are the parameters. Again, this is, these parameters I have here is from the American Heart Association. And they start off with an eleva elevated waist circumference. In men, it's greater than 40 inches, which is uh, 102 centimeters. And women, it is greater than 35 inches, excuse me, with 88 centimeters. Now, another parameter is dyslipidemia. That means a, an imbalance of your uh, blood levels of, of fats. So um, you're, you will have elevated triglycerides, which are, is greater than or equal to 100, 150 milligrams per deciliter, which is 1.7 millimoles per liter. And then you'll have reduced high-density lipoproteins, which are the proteins that, that bring the cholesterol from the cells back to the liver. Um, and the, you'll have a reduction of these. And the, in men, that will be less than 40 milligrams per deciliter, which is 1.03 uh, millivolts per liter. And in women, it is less, less than 50 milligrams per deciliter, which is 1.29 millivolts per liter. And hypertension, another parameter, is elevated blood pressure that is greater than or equal to 130 over 85. So elevated fasting glucose is greater than 100 milligrams per deciliter, which is 5.6 millimoles per liter. Now, the American Heart Association, they, they look at these parameters and say, okay, first off, the, we're going to say waist circumference, and this is according to the American Heart Association. You have, this is the predominant criteria. Now you take this, and if you um, are within this, then you look at two more. You can take two of, of one of these, two of any one of these, and add to that, and, and that will, they will consider you with metabolic syndrome. And again, all this leads to cardiovascular disease, stroke, and diabetes.